So we call this course Prerequisites to Sunni Theology. And the course actually is about uh, this word, teklif, which probably all of you know very well. Teklif, we translate in different ways as moral responsibility. What you'll see in this course is that the concept of teklif is subtle and it is nuanced. Uh, teklif is ethical responsibility. You are mukalla before God. And the verses that Shaykh Hamza recited were verses that conclude at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah with a, an explicit reference to teklif, that Allah does not impose upon anyone teklif that is beyond their capacity. So teklif is a very important concept, and many of us have studied about it a little bit. We talked today uh, about the prerequisites of teklif, that what is required for you to be mukalla, and we will see that you have three preconditions. We're going to talk about them in a few minutes. But many of us, we don't really think about teklif per se, and we don't have we don't reflect on it, and this is really important. Now, teklif is called the prerequisite for Sunni theology because the responsibility to know Allah, to know God, and to know the prophets, and to receive the prophetic message from the prophets, and to live by it, and to be moral and ethical and upright, um, you know, this comes with teklif, and the, so we have to talk about teklif, and after teklif comes, when we have teklif, then we have the first obligation that comes after that, which is the obligation to learn theology. Uh, you know, so this is why we refer to it that way, that um, if one doesn't have teklif, then there are no other obligations after that. If one does have teklif, then the first obligation is theology, is to learn about God and about the prophets and about the unseen. We won't be talking about that, but we'll be talking about teklif. This is a very, very important topic. And um, you know, so we have to understand what this means. This world that we live in is the abode of teklif. It is Tao teklif. Um, Teklif, moral responsibility, is also the aptitude to live a moral life and to draw near to God and to live a life that is acceptable. So, you know, we, as Muslims, we need to understand what is teklif, and that way also we can see whether uh, we are fulfilling the obligations that, te te that teklif imposes upon us. Uh, teklif should define our attitude towards the Creator, uh, towards the Prophet وسلم, towards the message that the Prophet وسلم, brought, and our approach to life. It is one of the most basic concepts and one of the most important of all concepts in Islam. So um, we will begin in this first uh, presentation uh, with the first precondition of taklid, and this is biological maturity, which in Arabic we call bulur, and we call it also by other words like ihtilam. Um, before we begin that, we want to talk a little bit about the importance of knowledge. Uh, our religion is a, a religion of knowledge. It's a religion that um, opens the doors to knowledge, and it makes knowledge, especially sacred knowledge, which is the knowledge of how we know God, and how we obey God, and how we please God, absolutely important. The Messenger said, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, seeking knowledge is an obligation for every Muslim. Seeking knowledge is a fariwa upon every Muslim. So Islam is based on this obligation. Islam is based on our response to this obligation to seek knowledge, 
to gain knowledge, to cultivate knowledge, and to live our lives on the basis of that. Uh, we have to know what puts us in this deen. We have to know what is it that qualifies us truly to be Muslims who have a religion that is acceptable to our Lord. And we have to know what puts us out of this deen. What are the things that if we believe them or say them or do them, that we actually rupture this relation that is between us and between God. And it is very important for us that we beware of creating comfort zones of self-satisfaction and negligence where we forget or we don't talk about the primacy of knowledge in our religion. Um, many of us speak of Islam as a very simple faith. Islam is straightforward. Islam is not complex. If Islam were complex, people wouldn't follow it. But in its directness and in its simplicity, it is a religion of deep knowledge, profound knowledge, and we have to learn that. Again, seeking knowledge is an obligation upon you. It's not just an obligation upon Sheikh Hamza or upon other scholars. You know, it is an obligation upon you personally. And you must not forget that. And you have got to be sure that what you know about this religion is sound and that what you know about this religion is adequate. This is what you will be asked about. This is the most important thing of all. This deen is about ultimate salvation. It is about living a life that is acceptable to God. And uh, we as followers of this great religion, and we as people who speak on the tongue of knowledge, you know, we have to be very, very clear about that. A lot of Muslims today have the idea that Islam really doesn't require much knowledge. It's very simple, it's very straightforward. Um, everybody gets it, and they create comfort zones in which they can live like that, and they, for, they for neglect the most basic things. So we have to beware of that. And in Darul Qasim, this is one of our primary objectives. In fact, this is our primary objective to focus on the knowledge which validates this religion, that makes it sound, and that gives us the keys to salvation. This life is very short, and when you go back to your Lord after this life, there will be only one thing that concerns you. Did I obey or did I not obey? Did I receive the prophetic message accurately and did I follow it or not follow it or not? And so many of the things that concern us today as Muslims, popularity and fads and what is acceptable to people and what is not, that must not get in the way of this very basic obligation that we have to live this religion properly, to know this religion. And that's all, that's what Tikbi is about. Ad deen and nasiha, as the Prophet said, that this religion is giving sincere counsel. You know, if you give counsel to me, it means that you are concerned with my interests. You are concerned with what will make me the best human being I can be. You're not concerned with how do I fit into the furniture of your life. How can I be manipulated? How can I be used? And when I speak to you, it has to be the same way. If I give you nasiha, it means I give you something that you truly need to know. It's not that I say something to you to get you in my party, or to get you to come to my group, or to have you as a follower. That's not what it's about. So uh, to emphasize the primacy of knowledge, this is part of nasiha. This is part of our obligation to speak about this religion in an honest way and in a way that constitutes counsel for you, so that when you go back to your Lord, you won't say, they betrayed me. They told me I didn't have to do these things. 
They told me I didn't have to know these things. They told me everything was okay, and it's not. And then who will you blame at that time? You know, so uh, knowledge is very important in our being. There is no practice without knowledge. You cannot pray if you don't know how to pray. You cannot purify yourself if you don't know the rules of water. Yeah, like what kind of water purifies and what doesn't? What is clean? What is unclean? And you have to know how to pray. Of course, most of us have learned these things from the time that we're little, and we take them for granted. But these are the most important things of all. These are the most important things. And ignorance is an ominous sign. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, among the signs of the coming of the last hour, of the last day, the end of the world, is that knowledge shall be removed and ignorance will be established. Again, beware of the comfort zones that say that we don't have to learn, everything's okay, we'll just enjoy ourselves. Okay? Um, that's the establishment of ignorance. Wine shall be drunk and fornication shall appear in an illicit sexuality, which is something that we see a great deal of in this time that we live in. Okay, this is a description of the age that we live in. So sacred knowledge opens the path to salvation. Sacred knowledge, the knowledge about God, the knowledge about the prophets, the knowledge about what God requires of me and what he requires of you. And ignorance closes off that path. The ignorant man or woman, as the Prophet taught us, وسلم, may say a word that they think nothing of, and they fall because of that insignificant word in their mind for 70 years into the top of the fire. They fall from the bridge, the sirah, 70 years until the surface of the fire, which is called Jahannam. Okay, so it's very important. We must know what we, what is right, we must know what is wrong, and we must be aware of ignorance. Ignorance, um, you know, so um, we live in a society that has extensive information. Um, you know, this is a society actually in which there's tremendous potential. Uh, we benefit a great deal in this society. And a lot of the things the Muslims are doing in the United States of America, the Dhamma Pasim, Zaytuna, the Tatlif, you know, um, Iman, many of these different groups that we have, Seekers Hub in Canada, Canada's very similar to us. These are really amazing developments. They're very, very monumental. And uh, I was in Egypt in, uh, at the end of January uh, this year, and I was with a lot of really interesting young Egyptians, mashallah. But some of them said that really when we look at what is being done in the United States, in Dawa al-Qasim and Zaytuna and Tatlif Collective and these other wonderful organizations, we really feel that that's the most significant thing happening in the Muslim world today. So it's very, very important. And inshallah may Allah enable us to remove this Ignorance, but we live in a society that has unparalleled information. We have access to information about so many things. These computers, these iPhones, the iPads, you know, all the technology that surround us. We know more things about the natural world, the world in which we live, the physical world, the chemical world, the biological world, than was even imaginable to human beings just a few generations ago. Yet, this information is not rooted. This information is not fully meaningful. This information is not information that necessarily leads to knowledge of what is the nature of reality. And as Allah says, they have knowledge of an outward dimension of this world. They know vahiran. They know an outward aspect of this world but of the hereafter, they are negligent. And so this is the component that we have to bring in. 
then how do we live in this world in the most intelligent way, in the wisest way? How can we be lights that guide to God and guide to his messenger, and yet at the same time benefit from this society and also benefit this society and ourselves by waking up to the reality that we live in and the reality of the world to come? The Messenger said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever takes a path by which he seeks knowledge, God will make easy for him a path to the garden. So that's about you. That's about me. And this is a well-known hadith that's transmitted in many collections. It also follows by saying that the scholars are the heirs of the Prophet. You know, so you have the obligation to take a path to seek knowledge. And when you do that, God will make easy for you the following of that path, and God will make easy for you the path to the garden. And here there are two paths that are spoken about. First of all, there's the actual physical path that you, know, you have to come here today, for example, to listen to this presentation, which I hope and pray is sound knowledge that will benefit you. So God makes it easy for you to do that. God facilitated for you to do that. And he will help you to take care of other problems that you have. In order to come here, you had to give up other things. There was a change of, right? You know, but God will bless all of that. He will bless that physical path, that time that you took to come. And then also there is the figurative path, which is the work, the effort, staying awake at night, reviewing notes, memorizing, making good use of our time. Al-ilmu aziz, in a'taytahu ba'da. إِنْ أَعْطَيْتَهُ كُلُّهُ كُلَّكْ أَعْطَاكَ بَعْضًا وَإِنْ أَعْطَيْتَهُ بَعْضًا لَمْ يُعْطِكَ شَيْئًا Knowledge is precious. It is more precious than diamonds and gold and silver. It is more precious than fame. Knowledge is the greatest thing. This world is cursed, our Prophet said. And everything in it is cursed except for knowledge. Ali, a man or woman of knowledge and a person who does the dhikr of Allah, and a person who teaches, right? So, um, you know, in, this, in taking the path of knowledge, God will bless you on both of those paths. You know, he will give you success. God uh, will give the seeker of knowledge success on both paths in this life and give him or her an easy path to the garden. And if God blesses you, and may he bless you all, with this and all of us with that. If he enables us to get this sacred knowledge, then you receive the inheritance, which is worth a thousand times, a thousand times anything that you could receive from your uh, family in inheritance, in gold and silver and property. And that is you become an heir of the property. And this is one of the most important things that we have to talk about in Tikvi, because Tikvi, this um, moral aptitude that we have, is about becoming true heirs of the Prophet, receiving the knowledge that they gave us and living by that knowledge authentically. <clears throat> knowledge is an essential part of Islam. So we must seek knowledge personally. Every one of us. It's not something that's for other people. You know, we have in this community, by the grace of Allah, great scholars. Um, Shaykh al Hafiz al Amin, who I have the honor to work with, I've known him for 13 years. This is a unique scholar. I do not know anyone that is his peer. We have scholars like that, Shaykh Hamza Yusuf, Imam Zayd, Shaykh Yahya Rodin, Shaykh Hamza Chowdhury. You know, we have so many, Shaykh Faraz Rabbani, you know, Dr. Jackson. We have many scholars in this community. But it's not, knowledge is not just for them. Okay? It's also for you. You know, this is also an obligation for you to seek. Personally, you must be sure 
that you know everything you have got to know to lead this life of yours in a way that is correct. And also we have to cultivate professional scholarship. We have to cultivate professional scholarship in our community. Um, you know, we have to build institutions that enable us to cultivate scholarship at the highest possible level. This is really, really important. And we have got to be able to create a dynamic dialogue where we engage every aspect of this society around us at the highest level, making it clear where does Islam stand on these things? Where is the light? Where is the guidance? Not just in the basic things like prayer and fasting and hajj and umrah, but also in things like bioethics, the environment, um, and, and other issues that we have. <clears throat> also as part of this, because this is a religion of knowledge, we have to honor the authority of the scholar. We have to honor our scholars, men and women, by virtue of the knowledge that Allah has blessed them with. This is your mission. You know, this is what you are required to do. And inshallah, you adopt that mission with the greatest of sincerity, and it is also Dawud Qasim's mission, which we are here to represent to the best of our ability. So, as we said, uh, we're here to talk about taklif, to go into taklif with some kind of depth, the secrets of taklif, uh, moral and legal aptitude. Uh, as we said, taklif is the most fundamental and far-reaching of all Islamic obligations, of all Islamic conceptions. Taklif is the purpose of our existence. It embodies the divine trust. The divine trust, the amana uh, that was given to us, this is all about taklif. It means that we uh, embrace taklif in the most honest way that we can. It also embodies the wisdom of God in the creation of the human being. And as we will see, it also is a reflection of his mercy. Teklif embodies the very essence of what it means to be human. This cosmic trust, the amana, about which, which we have spoken. Um, so, there are three preconditions of teklif, and we will focus on each of these for... Uh, hopefully about an hour, and then we will end by speaking about technique itself, and then we can have questions, bi ta'ala. Uh, the first precondition of technique is biological maturity. Uh, we might refer to that also as majority, that uh, you know, when the child ceases to be a child, when the child becomes a young adult. And we refer to that as bulug, and as we said, there are other, there's another word, ihtilam, which is also used for it, and is very meaningful. The second precondition of teklif is mental maturity, which is aql, intellect. And we'll talk about that. The ability to understand, and also aql, as we'll see, is the ability to be self-conscious. And it's the uh, ability to stand up for yourself, uh, to understand that certain things, you know, are that you need certain things, you have to have them, that other things are harmful, that you've got to keep uh, them away from you. Okay, so basic intellect, sound intellect. And then the third precondition of taklif is reception of the prophetic message which we call bulum ad da'wah, that we receive the da'wah, we receive the call that the prophets and the messengers have announced to human beings from the time of our father Adam, alayhi salam. So these are the three preconditions of taklif, and they are a matter of consensus among our scholars. They are a matter of ijma'ah. Um, all the imams agree to these in all of their schools. Hmm. 
and Debussy, he says that it is part of God's wisdom and mercy that there is no technique on children or on the children of Adam from the beginning of their lives or during childhood. Uh, it didn't have to be that way. That's not a logical necessity, but it's a function of God's wisdom and of his mercy. It is said that angels have technique from the moment they are created. Angels, as you know, are infallible. Angels don't sin. But this is actually a, a very subtle reality because they are mukallifun. They, they do carry moral uh, aptitude and also moral responsibility. And from the time that they're created, they have that. Adam and Eve, our mothers and fathers, uh, they also had technique from the time that they were created. Adam begins his first breath you know, with technique. And there are opinions about the jinn that differ. Uh, some scholars say that jinn have technique from the time that they are created, that intellect comes with them immediately, and others say that that's not the case. And we won't go into that. But in the case of us, the children of Adam, we begin our lives with this period of several years in which we are not held accountable, in which we can say whatever we say and do whatever we do, and God does not take this into account. And then there comes the watershed. There comes this time when all of a sudden we are responsible. We are accountable. And that comes with majority, with physical maturity. It comes with adequate intellect. And it comes also with perception of the truth. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the pen of divine reckoning has been lifted from three persons. This means that um, they will not be taken to account. They will not be judged. The pen of divine reckoning has been lifted from three persons, from the sleeper until he or she awakes, from the child until it reaches puberty, yahtalim, and from the insane person until he has intellect, until he returns to sanity and understands what he is doing. So children are not taken to account for wrongdoing. Um, this, however, does not deny the fact that when children do good, God gives them rewards. Allah is very merciful. So as we'll see, it's part of the teaching of our Prophet وسلم, that we train our children from a very early time that they do good. We teach them to have good character. We teach them to help others. We teach them to respect others. We should even teach them to pray when they're very little. And in fact, they get rewarded for that. God blesses them for that, but God does not take them to account. So the negative aspect of responsibility then uh, is something which is not there. If you do good, then God facilitates the path to do even greater good. Ibn Abbas uh, was asked when the orphanhood of the orphan is finished. Uh, we, in Islam, we refer to the yatim uh, as any boy or girl who has lost his father. Usually in the Western world, uh, we refer to the orphan as the one who lost the father and the mother. But in Islam, um, we call, we use that word for any child who loses the father. Um, you know, this is the way, that's, that's, that's our understanding of it. And uh, orphanhood lasts until the time that we become adults. So once a person is able to take care of himself or herself and is able to understand, then we don't call them an orphan anymore. So Ibn Abbas was asked when orphanhood uh, finishes, he said, by God. Wallahi, a man may grow up here and still be weak in standing up for himself. 
Man can grow a beard, and still he can't stand up for himself. <clears throat> and he can still be weak in giving of himself. Ba'if fil i'ta'i min nafsihi. When he begins to stand up for himself, <clears throat> um, seeking the beneficial things uh, that he needs and that people might take, uh, then you know we can refer to him as no longer being an orphan. So here you have a, a, a very interesting illustration of uh, the role of intellect and of maturity here. That is, it's not just physical maturity. As he says, a man might have a beard. Uh, a, a young boy may begin to grow a beard when he's quite young, maybe he's 12, 13, or 14. But he has to have another quality, and that is that he has the kind of self-consciousness, and he has uh, the kind of uh, assertion that enables him to say that I have to have this, I cannot have that. He stands up for himself. He understands where his benefit is. And he understands also where harm lies. And then he takes a distinctive position on that. Whereas a child often may not be like that at all. As they say, it's like taking baby from a candy, uh, taking candy from a baby. You know, of course, a lot of babies you can't take candy from them. But you know, uh, the, the baby doesn't necessarily understand, you know, the importance of things. Right? You might be able to take from them the dollar bill and to give them a nickel. They don't understand the differences between those things. So. Um, uh, this is also, this uh, clarifies the legal purport of biological maturity, that it's not enough in itself. We have to have a sense of identity. We have to have a sense of self-assertion that enables us to stand up for ourselves, to look out for our interests, and to be responsible. Imam Ali was asked the same question, and he said, there is no orphanhood after puberty. After ihtilam, but then Ibn Abbas he clarifies that it's not enough just to have a beard. You've got to have this other quality as well. Uh, Taklif and capacity. Uh, the foundational verse, or one of the foundational verses in Taklif, is the one that our Shaykh Hamza Chaudhry recited to us. God imposes no burden. La yukallifu upon a human self except to its capacity. لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا At the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 286, God imposes no burden, no moral burden, no ethical burden. God does not judge us. He does not impose a burden upon a human soul except to its capacity. A lot of us understand this verse in a way that is not the way the traditional commentators understood it. And a lot of us take this as sort of um, a statement about our personal odysseys in our lives. That, you know, God will never hold me responsible in my life. He will never test me with anything that is beyond my ability. That's not what it's about. But it's saying that, you know, tikliyif, which is this concept that we're talking about. You know, this moral aptitude, this moral license, this moral answerability that God will not put that on you beyond your capacity to bear it. And so therefore, when we talk about capacity here, we are fundamentally talking about being uh, of age, being strong enough, and being self-assertive enough that we can uh, live up to that responsibility, and that it means also that we have the intellect to understand what we are commanded to do, and that it means also that we have the content of the message. So this is the fundament, uh, this is the basic meaning of the verse according to our, our traditional scholars. Um, and this goes hand in hand with the beautiful hadith that we took just a minute ago about the angelic pen. Um, how are we coming with time in this first session? Uh, where, where is the time keeper? Uh, I can see that too. That's why I'm asking the question. Like, are we finished with the first uh, part? Or yeah, I don't think that's fair.
you know, but, uh, okay, so in that case, I'm going to have to speed up here. And um, we're going to talk about Arabic roots. Let's just look at one word. I was going to look at balagha, but, uh, you know, we'll skip that. And let's look at the root uh, ha-lam-mim. Now, this is the root from which we get puberty. Hulum and ihtilam. Ibn Faris, who is one of our great scholars of language, he says that this root, um, which implies puberty, attaining majority, um, you know, it has two root meanings, two semantic meanings at its base. One is not to haste, and the other one is to see a dream, especially an erotic one. And uh, we say, Halam as Sabi. And we say, Ihtalam as Sabi. Sabi is the child. And if we look at the word child, which we're not going to do because we don't have time, but the word Sabi in Arabic, it implies that the child does not have self control. The child doesn't have Hilm. He doesn't have the ability to rein himself in. So when the child gets beyond that, then he has pure puberty. Um, the Quran says, when your children attain puberty, al-hulum, let them ask permission to enter your private rooms. Uh, al raqib al-Isfahani says, maturity is called hulum uh, because the child who has attained it is capable of hilm, of forbearance, of self-control. And hilm also means akal. So it's very interesting, it means intellect as well, because self-control results from intellect. So it's very nice how in Arabic, uh, you know, this word combines the physical reality of puberty uh, with also this intangible element of the appearance of intellect in us. Al-Burusawi, who is one of our great scholars, he says about Hilm, which is this quality of forbearance, a person who is Halim does not hasten things. In the Arabic definition of the child, the Sabi, this is not the way the Sabi is. The, the Sabi hastes in the things that he wants or doesn't want. When the child wants to be nursed, <clears throat> he doesn't wait until an appropriate time, right? It could be 2 a.m., 1 a.m., when the child wants to be changed, when the child doesn't like something you've done, they don't wait. Immediately they let you know. And immediately they demand to have the thing that they want, or they demand to be released from the thing that they don't like. Uh, the halim endures difficult. This is very important. So physical maturity then gives us the ability to endure. Um, he is not perplexed when afflicted by unpleasant things. Ch children are. Children want something, and if you take it away, well, you might not call it being perplexed. They're angry. But they do not understand. You cannot make them understand that. He is not quickly moved to anger. Ibn Ashur, he says, Hilm is sound opinion. Good character <laughs> and being merciful to created things. So here we see the intrinsic connection between puberty, hulum, hulu, as a precondition of tikli, and self control, hilm, which is also a quality rooted in akal, intellect. Um, training children for hulu, we're going to skip some stuff, looking at that stopwatch back there. Um, the Prophet, may God extol him and grant him perfect peace, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, command your son to do the prayer at seven years of age. Spank them for not doing it at ten. And separate them in their beds at ten. So this is a very important hadith, and this hadith... Um, is addressed to you or to the guardian of the child. It's not addressed to the child himself or to children themselves. Again, they're not mukalla. They don't have that answerability in a bit you do. And um, our scholars took different positions on this. Uh, Imam Malik regarded this to be recommended. 
um, Imam Abu Hanifa, al Shafi'i, and Ahmed bin Hanbal, may Allah be pleased with them all, they took it to be obligatory that you must uh, have your children pray when they're seven years old. And you must see when they're ten that they do it. If he's seven or eight and they don't pray, you don't do anything. But when they're ten, you have to see that they do it. And many of us don't do that now. In our community, often uh, young men and women in our community, they may not start to pray or even think about praying until they're in college. And this is very serious. This is very serious. You know, so it's our responsibility as their guardians to get them into this habit when they're little. They are not morally required to do it. They're not morally required to pray until they are mukallafun. But you are morally required to guide them and to help them. Help them develop good habits. Then when it becomes time to pray, it's easy for them. If we don't do that, then when they come to be whatever age it is when puberty appears, uh, then often it's very difficult for them to pray. Um, if spanking is done, it must never be severe. And it's just to show that we are serious about this. And it's the, it is the threat that is much more important usually than the actual spanking. Um, and um, it should only be resorted to if we know that it will have a good effect. You know, so you know that some children, children differ. You all know that, right? Brothers and sisters differ. Some children are extremely affected by the threat of punishment. Some children are extremely affected by punishment itself. They won't do it again. Other children are not at all. Some children, uh, the threat of punishment doesn't mean anything, and punishment itself doesn't mean anything. So you have to be able to gauge that, you know, and we don't want to hurt the children, but we just want them to know that this is serious. You have to take this seriously, and uh, you must never insult them. Okay, this is something very important. Again, sometimes in Muslim households, uh, we don't do that. You know, there are certain Muslim cultures, you know, where uh, parents abuse their children. And sometimes they even curse their children. I've heard that. I've lived in Muslim countries where I've actually heard parents curse their children. And teachers in school curse the children if the children don't do what they're supposed to do. That is the most vile language of all at all. And you have to be very careful. We say, the sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Who made that aphorism up? That's, that's not true at all. I forget about the sticks and the stones. And my broken bones, they get well. But the word that my father said to me, that cut into my heart, that I never will forget. Or my mother. That's why you, as an adult, especially when God blesses you with children or grandchildren, Watch your tongue. Be very careful what you say. Children and children hear things and they remember things that we pay no attention to. I know of a child whose uh, father, whom he loved very much, told him that, uh, you know, you're lazy and you're like this good-for-nothing neighbor that we have who just would sit outside and read newspapers all day and not work. And that child bore the burden of those words for decades in his life. And it, 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 because he believed his father. It's not like my father is telling me this so that I will be good. It's like, then I'm a failure. Although he was like 10 years old. See, but it's like, what am I going to do then? Because I'm not like you. You know, you work hard. You're, you're a responsible adult. I'm like this neighbor who's a good for, for nothing. See, so we have to be really careful what we say. We do not insult children. We do not use vile language with children. Um, uh, we have different kinds of children, and we have very little time. Um, but it's very important to instill exertion, exertion which is sad in the Quran, the ability to work, the ability to exert yourself. You know, this comes with puberty. 
that the, 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 the young adult is now able to do hard tasks, which children are not able to do. Okay, but you have got to ex instill exertion in our children. We see today a lot of young people, they cannot discipline themselves. They cannot stay on task. They can't even listen. You know, their um, you know, span of attention is extremely short. And they need pictures, they need images, you know, they've been brought up on video games. You know, and this is something we have to be really careful about. You know, and uh, even uh, young adults that are going to become policemen and that go into the army, a lot of times if the sergeant yells at them, they begin to cry. Can you believe that? That is true. This is the generation of people we have today. That they used to be the sergeant, you know, would uh, yell at you and you're drafted or you've enlisted, you just take it, you know, and you don't like it, but like, I will do this. And today, you have people, you know, that will cloud up and begin to cry. Well, why do you talk to me like that? It's like, what, you're going to be a soldier? This is, this, and this is a major defect in, a, in the culture that we have. So you've got to instill in your children, sorry, the ability to exert themselves. And the most important thing to do is to have them praying when they are little. Uh, this training is ta'id. And, um, you know, uh, buru must be preceded by basic learning and exertion. Ibn Sina says, before seven, uh, children should not be instructed in anything other than basic morality, good character, and proper behavior in the household. He said, after seven, then you can begin to teach them the difficult things. I know a lot of you uh, really pay a lot of attention to your children, and a lot of you, uh, in fact, begin teaching children relatively difficult things before they're seven. Uh, whether that's the wisest thing or not to do is something to be discussed uh, in another time. But again, Ibn Sina, who has a lot of medical and psychological knowledge, he felt that when the child, up until the time of seven, it's very good for the child to be relatively free. And, you know, you want to give them moral teachings. You want to teach them to respect others. Um, you want to teach them to help out in the house. Uh, you know, you have to give them guidance. But don't make life difficult for them. When they come to the age of seven, then you can begin to teach them um, things that lead to adult knowledge. And of course, you have your own research to do on that, and you have your own view. Um, the child is a wali prior to guru. This is something we'll talk about in a minute. This is very interesting. Every child is a wali of Allah. Children are born with the fitra. They are born with this beautiful, natural, believing, obedient nature that we have. And uh, they have that. This is what makes children so beautiful. Uh, I gave a speech on Malcolm X. I gave two speeches on Malcolm X at a, a very great Islamic school in Chicago. And first they had me talk to the little kids. And like that was so much fun. And they have all studied about Malcolm X and they have all sorts of questions and they're all raising their hands. They all want to ask questions and get answers. And then after that, I went to talk to the high school students. And they're just like, whatever, <laughs> whatever. You know, I mean, it's like most of them, it's like they were so different. And um, one of the reasons for that is because of the fact that those children are awliya of Allah. They're like little angels. This is how they're born. This is also why we do not use vile language and we do not insult children. And we do not abuse children. This is abuse of the awliya. And this is Muslim children and non-Muslim children. You know, we have to honor children. But when bulur comes, which is this appearance of intellect, the ability to make decisions, then also, this is part of the wisdom of God, the wilaya, 
that is natural in that child is eclipsed. And now they become people who have powerful desires, powerful emotions, um, they can become clouded, they can become darkened, they're very different. Okay? It's very important in education to try to sustain that milay, that beautiful sainthood that is there in the child, so that it goes into the young man or woman that has puberty. But nevertheless, as a rule, the wilaya of Pitra, the wilaya of the natural believing self, that ends at the time that we reach puberty. And then what happens at that time, this other faculty kicks in, and that is intellect, that enables us discursively, in terms of the things that we see in this world, the concepts that we share with others, to talk about God and to talk about truth, and to talk about value. And it's very important that that transition is made. Um, okay. Uh, so, I think that uh, we will probably have to end here. Um, yeah, I think we can end here, but in any case, let's just end with something that a lot of you know. Uh, one of the things about puberty, and this is one of the wisdoms of God in making puberty a sign of taklif is the fact that it is tangible. It is something that you can actually measure and quantify. And it is, of course, the biological self growing into an adult that is now capable of that very fundamental human necessity of reproduction. That women are able to have babies, men are able to have children. Okay, so therefore the signs of puberty are both biological and those are the basic criteria. And then they are also age, but age could be said to be a default criteria. In other words, we expect that there will be biological signs and if those biological signs, for some reason, don't appear, then we will go by age. The biological signs are those very fundamental things, you know, that we, in talking about human beings as the reality that we are, uh, don't, we're not ashamed to talk about. And these are those things that are connected to reproduction. So we have the emission of semen, and you also have uh, vaginal fluid, in sleep or otherwise. That when those occur in the male or the female, then we have puberty. That is a clear physical sign. We also have akramatum Allah, Allah bless you, the growth of the uh, coarse pubic hair okay, in the male and the female. So those are very clear signs. They show that puberty has been reached. And then also in the case of women, you have menstruation and also uh, pregnancy. Usually, of course, pregnancy is delayed, but pregnancy sometimes can very, very early. And when that ability to have children uh, comes, then, of course, we have uh, puberty. Uh, the stomatikis also add other things, voice change, a cleavage in the tip of the nose, um, odor, you know, in the armpits, things like that. These are things that are uh, indications of the fact that the human being has now entered a new biological stage. If that doesn't appear, then we go by age, the default criterion, in the absence of biological signs. And for Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, that is 18 lunar years. And for Abu Yusuf al Shaybani, the Shaykh Khan, the great uh, heirs of Abu Hanifa, and for Imam al Shafi'i, and for Imam Ahmed al Hanbal, it is 15 lunar years. Okay, so um, we're, we're going to close here so that we can go to the next presentation. Um, now, should we do that immediately? We go into the next presentation? Or do we take a break? Or we stand up? Or what, what do we do? 
Okay, so then if you don't mind, we'll take a few minutes of uh, break and then so let's continue then with the second presentation, which is intellect. Uh, we refer to Bulu as biological maturity, and uh, perhaps we could refer to Apo as, as mental maturity. It means that the person has sufficient ability to conceive and to understand. It refers to a basic and adequate competence. And uh, the onset of intellect is the guide to reflection and to sound behavior by choice. Um, if we look again at the hadith, the pen of reckoning, uh, we can see that uh, it, it really focuses on intellect. Uh, the pen of reckoning has been lifted from three, three persons, the sleeper until he awakes, because the person who is sleeping is a person who uh, does not have the full use of intellect. And then also we have the insane person until he has intellect. Again, because he is deprived or she is deprived of that basic we saw when uh, we looked at the meaning of hulun, of puberty, that amazing, amazingly in Arabic semantics, um, puberty and intellect, they go together, they mesh uh, together. Um, it's important that uh, we emphasize that Puberty has independent value. In other words, it's not just there because it is an outward sign of intellect. Um, when the child uh, reaches maturity, then the child begins to develop physical strength, endurance, um, other qualities, a strong identity that enable them to be themselves. Uh, but at the same time, uh, puberty is an index of aqal. A puberty is something that is tangible. It is something that is quantifiable. Whereas apple is something that is subtle. It is intangible. It is often arbitrary. It is difficult to discern. One of our great scholars at Debussy, he said by stipulating Buru, by making physical maturity a precondition of Tikli, God put the outwardly manifest condition a setable vahir, biological signs or age, in the place of the inwardly hidden condition, a setable vahir, which is the appearance of intellect. Puberty is quantifiable, intellect is not quantifiable. Um, Okay, uh, things are known by their contraries. So usually when uh, our scholars talk about uh, how we know whether a person has intellect or not, uh, they look at the contraries of intellect. And um, so therefore, um, we look at things like insanity that is mentioned in the Hadith. We look at things also like imbecility or dementia, altaha. We look at things like foolishness, stupidity, etc. So these are qualities that are contradictions of intellect. Intellect is that quality that negates insanity, that negates imbecility and dementia, that negates stupidity and foolishness, that enables us to live our lives in a serious way. Also, uh, we look at contraries that represent lack of access to the faculty. So sleep, for example, takes away access to intellect. A loss of consciousness, if you faint, or if uh, you, know, you have a fever and lose consciousness. You know, when you do that, you are not morally responsible. You are not mukhelin. Things like epilepsy. 
Also forgetfulness. Uh, if you forget that you didn't pray Asr, then Allah will remove from you the burden of that forgetfulness and you pray it when you remember it. This is one of his mercies. Also inattention, distraction, ghafla, and um, khata, which we can translate, I believe, as honest mistakes. Not a mistake that is a willful mistake that comes out of neglect or ignoring <coughs> what is right, but just an honest mistake. There are also other contraries that our scholars refer to in the definition of intellect, um, such as conditions that <coughs> obstruct the faculty, uh, intoxication, sukkah, taking drugs, tehidil, um, also willful compulsion from others. I guess we could just say compulsion. But like if people force you to do something, if uh, someone puts a knife in your hand and forces your hand to stab someone, then you are not responsible for that. You do the best that you can do to avoid it. But compulsion removes the effect of intellect. It obstructs it. And then we have also something which our scholars refer to as ilja, which I have translated here as overpowering circumstances, non-willful circumstances. And uh, they use as an example of that things like uh, falling off of a cliff or being swept away in a flood. You know, there are things that happen to us that are not compulsion per se, but when they happen, we lose control, usually. I mean, we have certain people who are very strong who, uh, you know, if they fall from a height, then they will think about how am I going to land and I've got to be really careful. But the ordinary human response would be just to scream, I'm falling, right? And uh, you know, they have people that if they were caught in a flood, they would begin to think about how can I get myself out of that? But that's a very unusual human condition. And in fact, that's the kind of thing that usually you can only do if you've been specially trained. Like, for example, you see people like stunt men and stunt women, you know, who jump off of buildings and run through fires. You know, they have to go through a lot of training so that they can do that still using their intellect and making sure that their bodies are doing the right kind of thing. Had they not been trained, then they would be probably in a condition like most of us, ilja, where we just scream, we lose it. So, um, you know, in cases like that, uh, also uh, the teklif is removed because the intellect is removed. O oh, you who believe, do not approach the prayer while intoxicated until you know what you are saying. That is, until you know Um In fact, the uh, sukran, you know, which is the Arabic word for and for being intoxicated, being drunk, um, you know, is from the word sakar, which is to close. In Arabic today, uh, in dialect, it's a sakar bab, close the door, which comes from that same root. And a sukar is called closing because of the fact that it closes the intellect. It uh, blocks off access to it. Uh, Islam is based on aql. Islam is a religion of intellect. It is a rational, reasonable religion. But uh, intellect is one of its provinces. Intellect is one of its objectives. And this religion is based on the imperative to guard and to protect and to cultivate intellect. And as uh, you know, in Islam we have certain major objectives of the prophetic law, which we refer to as maqasid al-sharia, the ultimate goals of the sharia, uh, which are six. Some scholars make them five. I prefer to have six. And these are preservation of the deen, preservation of sound religion, this is something we must absolutely do. This is why we are here today. This is why we take our religion seriously. This is why we study. This is why we honor scholars. 
This is why we have to develop institutions like Dalwell Hassan and Zaytina and other institutions. We must preserve the religion, and it's got to be sound, it's got to be authentic. It has to embody the message that our Prophet delivered to us. This is the first obligation. Okay, and then you have to preserve the nafs, the self. You must be safe from attack. You must be safe in your home. You must be safe in your car. You must be safe, as safe as you can be from disease. You must be healthy to the extent that that's possible. So we have an obligation to protect our physical self, to eat right, to drink right, to get enough sleep, and you know, to protect ourselves from all kinds of dangers. Right? This human being has got to live. This human being has got to flourish. And then comes aql, intellect. So this fundamental quality that we have, which is the opposite of insanity, which is the opposite of intoxication, which is the opposite of, uh, of foolishness and imbecility and so forth, this quality must be preserved. It must be guarded. We must do everything that we can as a community to see that we are ukhala, that we are men and women of reason. Our religion is a religion of reason, of wisdom, of goodness, of justice. And sometimes we see Muslims do the strangest things unbelievable things. But this is a sign of deviation. This is a sign of harmful innovation. That they fail to understand anymore the, the, the rational content and objective of the faith. They're not aware of consequences. They are not looking at consequences. Okay, so we have to preserve intellect. And uh, of course intellect is uh, where we begin the religion technique, and then we have to preserve it and cultivate it. Then also we have what is called nasal, which is progeny or lineage. And uh, nasal is lineage. You know, nasal is progeny, having children. And nasal is lineage. Like, who is your father? Who is your mother? Alhamdulillah, you know that. Uh, who are your fathers? Who are your mothers? You know, that's really important. And uh, you know, many times, especially today, there are many people who don't know the answer to that question. Even in the days of the Prophet, there were people who didn't know who their father was. Okay? And uh, this is something which is a big burden to them. Uh, you know, Islam is the father of a person who has no father. And Islam we Islam removes whatever was before it. So these are very important things. Um, you know, then we can also say that this is part of family, you know, and it's also part of identity. Um, you know, every year I have the honor to go to the Gambia. We do some programs there that uh, I hope are beneficial, but certainly beneficial for me. And um, African Americans often come to be with us in the Gambia, and many of them, their roots are actually from that country, or if they're not from that country, they're from that area. And um, the benefit that comes to them from reconnecting with that root is amazing. And I've seen it in people uh, such as our brother Mustafa Davis, Allah bless him, that like he is a sound human being. He is a deeply rooted human being. And it's like, in my mind, it's like, will Mustafa Davis also be affected by this? And he was deeply, you know, and because this is the secret of who am I? Where do I come from? Who are my fathers? Who are my mothers? It's a very important thing. So Islam protects that to the extent that we are able to do so. And then mal, which is property, halal wealth, halal property. You know, you are responsible. You have to earn it in the best way. You have to take care of it, and you can't just throw it away. Um, when we talk about Apple, 
again, we have to talk here today that we have to respect. But rusht is a concept that is very closely connected to aql. And rusht in Islamic law, when it is defined, is almost always defined in terms of whether you know how to use money. Do you throw your money away? How many cars do you buy? How many shoes do you have? Um, sisters, forgive me. Any sisters probably have special license in that regard. I remember this one uh, sister who invited uh, my wife, who's over here, uh, you know, to come to her house, and she said this would be private. There'd just be like four people here, and we opened the door, and there were like fifty pairs of shoes. And I, and I went upstairs. I, I thought you said this was going to be private. She said it is. I said, "What are the shoes?" She said, "They're my shoes." <laughs> like what? Fifty pairs of shoes? She probably had another fifty pairs in the, in the closet. But that's actually not regarded as you wish. You have to use your money carefully. They get it right and keep it and let it grow in a, in a way that is, and be generous with it. Also, that's part of the proper use of it. And then ilm, which is honor and dignity, that you have honor. We have honored, you know, the children of Adam. You know, and uh, you know, you have to stand up for your honor. You have to stand up for your dignity. You know, this is a very important thing. But uh, here we just we really wanted to talk about uh, aqal. So salvation is based on knowledge. And knowledge is based on aqal. How do you learn that knowledge? How do you remember that knowledge? How do you um, how do you own that knowledge? How do you make it a part of you? That's aqal, right? You think about it, you think about it. Uh, performance is not enough. La yaqdi al qadi wa huwa baltan, the prophet said. The judge shall not hand down the judgment while he is angry. Why? Because when the judge is angry, just like you or me, our intellects are not functioning properly. And the judge has got to be able to be balanced. This is very important. We have to keep this in mind also when we talk about things like boards of directors and imams and heads of community, that when you are angry, excuse yourself. Because you need to do what you do and say what you say when you are balanced and when the intellect is functioning. The husband and wife, that's also extremely important. You know, the, the marital life is a beautiful thing. It's also a great test. And when those things happen to us that lead to misunderstanding between husband and wife, beware of anger. And beware of the stupid things that we are inclined to say when we are angry. These things can ruin the situation. You know, so intellect is so beautiful. And this is again why we have to guard it. Beware of anger. The man came to the prophet and he said, give me counsel, right? I'll <coughs> me. And the prophet said, no, no. do not lose your temper. Do not be angry. He said, give me another counsel. Do not be angry. He said, well, tell me something. Do not be angry three times. That this was a person, obviously, who this is what he needed to do. Control your anger. And um, we have to guard our intellect. And one of the ways we do that is to guard against anger. Anger turns us all into fools. The most intelligent human being, when he or she becomes angry, says things and does things they would never do otherwise. Um, we have to preserve our rational balance. We must keep the intellect intact, and we must keep it in control. Uh, it must be preserved from overpowering emotions. Anger here, um, as some of our scholars have noted, is an illustration. It's not as if anger is the only problem. No. Any powerful emotion that overpowers you your passions, our biases, our personal preferences, uh, our friendships, our enmities. You know, we have to deal with these in the most fair and just way that we can in order to preserve the balance of intellect. 
We must always seek to open the door of objectivity and fairness. Um, if we look at Arabic roots, I, we're going to cut this down a little bit, but let's just look at the one, the word we're talking about, aqal. So the root of aqal in Arabic is uh, ayin, which academicians like to use this little tiny c that you see. That's the ayin, a. It is a consonant, a vowel, and um, it is in all the Semitic languages and Hamitic languages. A. Ayin, ha, lam. Um, Aql is the fundamental moral aptitude. Uh, remember again the quotation of Ibn Abbas when he said that a man may grow a beard, yet he still cannot stand up for himself. He still cannot assert himself. He cannot claim what, it is, what is his right, and he cannot defend himself from things that will harm him. So Aql is that quality. It enables us to take a stand, that I will insist on this, even though I don't want to do it, even though it's not pleasant, even though it means maybe that I come into conflict with people that I don't want to be in conflict with them, but I will try to do it in the best way, the most intelligent way that I can. So Apple is the basis of moral action. Ibn Fadis, when he talks about this word, he says that aqala, the root, has the basic meaning of hubsa, which means to hold back. Uh, we use it in Arabic, for example, to hobble the camel, you know, which is when you take an iqal, which is from the same root, and you, you, you tie up the camel's leg. And uh, then the camel can't do very much. Have you ever seen a camel hobble? I've seen it in Mauritania. Um, I remember the first camel I saw hobbled in Mauritania was a big camel. It was one of the biggest ones going, the Mercedes Benz of the camel family. And they had tied up his leg, he was a stallion, and that camel actually was afraid because he was so big that if he fell to the ground, he would hurt himself. And camels, he knew that. So he had spread his legs out. He was like a tripod. And he wasn't going anywhere. You can I've seen smaller camels that they hobble and they will just hobble along. That's where we get the word hobble. You know, they go slowly. They can't go very far. <clears throat> but the big camel, once you hobble him, at least in my limited experience, he just stands there. Because if he falls to the ground, then he may be ruined. He may break a leg or something like that. So this is the root that we get aqal from. The aqal hobbles you. What does it hobble you from? From doing what is wrong. From saying the thing that you must not say. From doing the thing that you must not do. From drinking the drink you should not drink. From eating the food you should not eat. From looking at the woman you should not look at. Or the man that you shouldn't look at. Right? So here, aql hobbles, yachdis, it uh, controls, it holds us back. And we also use aql um, in Arabic as a root meaning uh, for that which, for, for that faculty that holds us back from reprehensible statements and deeds. So uh, in Arabic, you have many words for intellect. Lub and Yuha, uh, there are many words, but Akal is the one that we focus on here because Akal has a fundamentally moral quality, fundamentally ethical quality. You know, you are not Akal, and you are Akal, the Ibni Ta'ala, but we are not Okala until we can say no to the things that we want to do that we should not do. And until we can say yes to the things that we are supposed to do that we don't want to do. And you know how difficult that is. That is more difficult than lifting weights, you know, and carrying burdens and cleaning the whole house and building a new house, right? 
for me to do the thing I don't want to do, like study. Sometimes you don't want to study. I, mean, I know that I should study, but like, it's so easy to check email. It's so easy to look at the news on BBC, right? And then like, no, don't do that. This is time for you to study, to prepare, you know, for your class or prepare your lesson or review the Quran or whatever it may be. So Akhul is that gift that enables you to do that. And also don't do the things you know you're not supposed to do. There's certain things you're not supposed to look at. There's certain things you're not supposed to listen to. There's certain things that we don't eat and drink and so forth. So Akhul is that quality that says you don't do this. Okay? And uh, that is essential to our moral character. Um, Arabi bin Isfahani says, when God reprimand, reprimands the godless for lack of aql, for lack of intellect, it refers to their lacking intellect that leads them to guidance and holds them back from ruin. In other words, like they don't use their intellect. You know, they strip the screw. It doesn't work anymore. So anyone in their rational mind that would think about life and think about the world that we live in and think about the proximity of death and evaluate the prophetic legacy, especially crowned with the legacy of the last prophets. Why don't you accept guidance? Why don't you do this thing? Even though, yes, you won't be able to eat pork anymore, you won't be able to drink wine anymore, but you can live with it. You will open for yourself the door to all good do it. This is a deficiency in intellect. And then, why do we not hold back from the path of ruin? People who take drugs, people who drink, have drinking problems, they know this is ruin. And yet, they can't stop. People who are addicted to pornography. Pornography is extremely destructive. Extremely destructive in every way. And yet, can't stop. Okay, this means there's no awful. It means there's no intellect. You've got to stop. You've got to be strong. One of the great things about the fast of Ramadan is that it cultivates in us intellect. Akhul. This ability to say no and to say yes. That I'm going to fast every day of this month. As difficult as that may be. And I will deprive myself of food and drink and other things during this time. And I will not break that fast. I won't go into the kitchen and drink a drink of water that no one can see. And when we are able to hold to that as you do, one of the great gifts that this gives us is that it cultivates apple. It cultivates intellect. The ability to say yes even though we don't want to do it, and the ability to say no, even though we do want to know it. The path to the fire is paved with delicious and delightful and pleasant things. But you've got to say it's forbidden fruit. I will not taste it. I will not go there. And the path to the garden is paved with difficulty. And you've got to say that I will do this. I will pray my I will keep good company. I will learn my religion. You know, and I will do what is right. So this is the fundamental quality of Akhul. When God reprimands the, reprimands the godless for lack of Akhul, it refers to lacking intellect that leads them to guidance, that leads them to accept guidance and holds them back from ruin. Um, Allah says, it is not the eyes that become blind, Eyes do become blind, but that's not the blindness that Allah reprimands. Uh, but the hearts within the breast that go blind. And he says, deaf, dumb, and blind in the heart, in the intellect. They will never understand. They will never use their reason to understand. They have it, but they don't use it. They don't have the habit of listening to it. The worst of beasts that tread upon the earth in the sight of God are the deaf and dumb. 
those who do not use their reason to understand. Apavari says they are the worst, the most evil of all that walks on the earth. These people, they listen to other things instead of the truth. Be sure that we don't do that. Listen to the truth. Don't listen to anything else. They listen to other things than the truth so that they no longer hear the truth or give it any consideration. They can't even recognize it. You know, lying is one of the moral qualities that our Prophet loathed more than anything else. And in fact, the early Muslims, one of their qualities was that they did not lie. They were honest people, as a rule. Their culture was a, a culture in which people kept their word. There were, of course, people who didn't, hypocrites and others. But as a rule, in that early Arab society, people kept their word. And when you keep your word and you're honest as you are, then there are gifts that come from that. Of course, you get light, you know, your heart is filled with good. But also, you can then recognize the truth. You can then know a truthful man. Just like the Bedouin who came up to the Prophet and looked at him and said, this is not the face of a liar. Liars have faces that show that. And you, because you're an honest man, you don't have that face, and you know that this brother doesn't have that face, and this sister doesn't. When people lie, they one of the curses that comes with that is that they can no longer tell the difference between the liar and the one who speaks the truth. And in fact, they even get to where they cannot tell the lie from, from truth. And uh, I, I know people that are afflicted with that. You know, it's like they cannot tell the truth. And sometimes it's almost as if by telling a lie, they think they change reality. What is happening? What is happening? So, Apple holds us to these good qualities. Don't strip the screw. Protect it. Keep it strong. Um, Atabari says then, you know, that uh, they listen to things other than the truth so that they no longer can hear the truth. They can't even recognize it when it comes or give it consideration. They do not have the intellect to follow God's command and to observe his prohibition. And your ability to follow the command of Allah and to stop short of the prohibition, this is awful. This is intellect, this great gift that you have. We could talk about that in detail. Aqal, as we said, is intangible. That's why part of the mercy and the wisdom of God is he puts puberty and intellect together. Puberty is tangible. It is quantified. And usually, when it appears, Apple has already come. In fact, Apple may begin to appear in a lot of boys and girls when they're even seven years old, depending on who they are, depending on their parents, their environment, and so forth. But Apple has subtle degrees. Um, Imam al-Ghazali, may Allah be pleased with him, he says, it is the sunnah of God that certain human faculties, such as aql, occur and develop by degrees. You are capable of incredible use of them. You are capable of flying to the greatest metaphysical truths by way of your aql. Really, truly, when we study aqidah, which is the next requirement that comes after taklid, we talk about that. And we, in Islam, we believe in alcohol. We believe in pure reason. And we can use pure reason to fly. You know, when you talk about the history of logic, you know, a lot of people say that, oh, Muslims, they follow Platonic, Aristotelian logic, and, you know, they should be following modern logic. No, modern logic hasn't done anything new. The only thing modern logic did was to say that logic must be hollow. You will not be allowed to use logic for any metaphysical proposition. That's what it's about. 
the, the limitation of so-called modern logic is all about restricting the use of the human mind to tangible things, quantifiable things, like computers and mathematics, so that you cannot say that the finite points to the infinite. And it does. And you cannot say that possible existence necessarily implies the realm of necessary existence. And it does. And that you can't even look at the point universe theory, the expanding universe theory that they call the Big Bang, which is a lousy name. And they say that, and you say, this is creation from nothing. It's what it is. It is creation from nothing. But they will say, no, there can be no metaphysical intrusions in physics. What? How am I supposed to understand this? I have an intellect that is able to look at the point theory of the universe and say, subhanAllah, this is creation from nothing. They say, I can't conceive of that. And you're not allowed to say that. I am allowed to say that. I'm a free man. You're a free man. And we will have our own schools. And we will have our own institutions where the intellect is free to grow and free to speak. This is very important. The Western world in the last 250 years has hobbled intellect. You will not use this to tell me anything about metaphysical truth. You will not be able to look at the world around you, the world of change, and to tell me that change indicates temporality. It does. And you will not be able to tell me that this world cannot be taken for granted. Random cannot produce anything. And it can't. But that's an intellect which Aristotle and Plato and the ancients in general knew was the highest form of knowledge, we would say after prophecy. Okay? So uh, intellect is, is really important, and it has degrees. Imam al-Ghazali says, it begins like the break of dawn. So this beautiful child that you have that is your responsibility, whether it's your own child or your nephew, your cousin, or an orphan that you've adopted, or whoever it may be, you know, when this dawn begins to uh, break in them, you have to take care of it. This is a precious, precious gem. It is almost imperceptible in the beginning, and then grows stronger and stronger and stronger until sunrise. Apple first appears in the child, often at seven, sometimes even before seven. You know, Friedrich Gauss, who was one of the great mathematicians. Mathematics is pure intellect. It's pure intellect pertaining to quantity. Geometry is pure intellect pertaining to quantity, uh, uh, connected quantity. Mathematics is numbers. And his father was a great mathematician at uh, a famous German university, Göttingen. And his father would correct mathematics papers. You know, and he'd put uh, his son Friedrich on his lap, and Friedrich would watch it, and no doubt his father would teach him things also. And then, at the age of something like seven or eight, Friedrich Gauss began to correct his father. Right? Intellect. That is intellect. It's not necessarily moral intellect. We can't assume that Friedrich Gauss knew that he shouldn't smoke, or that he shouldn't drink, or you know, that he shouldn't uh, curse or that he shouldn't be mean to his sister or something like that. You know, because that's a different dimension of intellect. But nevertheless, the light of intellect, you know, the light of intellect uh, appeared in him and in many children at a very early age. Okay, so it appears and then it grows and it grows and it grows. And you have to cultivate it. And this religion, the way we pray, the way we fast, the things we do, this cultivates intellect marvelously. You know, one of the greatest things in intellect is to know that certain things are necessary. One plus one is two. Certain things are impossible. One plus one is not three. It cannot be. And certain things are possible. That's the way intellect works. And you live a life in which certain things are obligatory. <coughs> you must pray five times a day, and you do. Certain things are prohibited. You cannot look at pornography, and you do not. Okay? And certain things are recommended, and you try to do them, and other things are disapproved, and you try not to do them, and we don't blame you if you do, because we can't, we're not allowed to. And certain things are neutral, mubah. You could have put on a green sweater or a yellow sweater, that's all up to you, right? 
So when we live inside of these hudud, what does that do to you? It's like a physical, psychological, moral way of living that cultivates an intellect that knows that if it is necessary, it is true. If it is impossible, it is not true. If it is possible, it could be true. And this enables us to believe in a way that is absolutely profound and in a way that we have to teach other Americans and Canadians and Westerners and other people today to think. Um, okay, so um, this uh, skip on a little bit, I'm running out of time. Uh, sound intellect. Uh, so the jurists, when they talk about intellect as a function or precondition of um, they're really talking about the first basic intellect, sound intellect. And they often use the word which is the soundness of intellect, the balance of intellect. You know, when intellect now is really able to do all the things that it's supposed to do. And it will do much more, but it's now able to do the basic task. And this is the basis of technique. This is the basis of moral responsibility. Um, it is the basic moral aptitude and intellectual capacity that brings the ability to understand and to perform what is good and to leave what is evil and to do what is required by technique. So, yatidal, this word that we're using here, uh, in Arabic, it's used for the middle position between, between two streams. Two extremes, I'm sorry. It's used for the middle position between two extremes. Ya'tidal is the middle position between hot and cold. It is the middle position between tallness and shortness. It is the middle position between heaviness, being, being heavy, fat, and slim. Okay, so akal then, uh, from a legal standpoint, the precondition of technique is that middle point between the inception of tamiz, which is the ability to make distinctions, and between the full development of intellect as this monumental gift that God has given us. At Debussy says, it differs from person to person and is difficult to discern. Uh, because of this difficulty, again, uh, Bulur is put there as an index to help. Um, primacy of intellect. Uh, at Debussy says, when God created the human being for the trust, God honored him or her with intellect, so that he be worthy of the trust. This is what makes you truly human. Akal is the noblest of all things God created. It represents our totality as a human being. You know, so when we talk about aqal, we're not just talking about mental capacity. And we're also not just talking about moral capacity to do what is right and not do what is wrong. Actually, we're talking about the whole you. The whole you. You as an organic totality. Um, al Ghazali says, aqal is more noble than God's throne. The throne is the greatest thing that God created. But aql is more noble than that. The aql that is in your heart. The aql that is in your chest, in your brain. And if this is more noble in the sight of God than the throne of God himself above the seven heavens. Okay, so you have to take care of it. You have to preserve it. Um, aql is bestowed is a capacity bestowed on us by mercy. As we said before, when bulur comes, um, and end comes to innocence, um, the intrinsic vilaya, the sainthood of the child, it ends with the appearance of these passions that are, sec that, that are associated with the sexually mature person. Bulur veils the soul. Okay, the apple is the key that opens access back up to the light. It appears with Bulu as a rule and enables us to bring about the gradual unveiling of the soul. Apple enables us to understand and it makes the burden lighter. 
Apple is referred to as the universal messenger. Some of our scholars refer to it as Rasul al-Apple, the messenger which is in the way. Al-Razi says, it may be said that Apple is God's universal messenger to humanity. It is the messenger without which the message of no messenger can be established as true. How do you know that this Quran is so beautiful, that it is so rational? How do you know it's the truth? How do you know when you study the life of the greatest of all creation, our beautiful prophet, Salah How do you know this is the truth? You've got Apple. You've got a heart, right? You know this is the truth. You're able to recognize it. Apple is the initial messenger. It is a Rasul al-Asli, they say. It is the first messenger, the fundamental messenger. Because if you don't have it, then you can't benefit from the prophet. You can't understand Jesus or Moses or the Prophet Muhammad, or any of them. Um, the ability to distinguish between truth and falsehood comes with Apple. Apple allows us to understand the binding proof of rational demonstration and the fact that it must be followed. There is no taklif on the child or the fool. <coughs> Um, among the primary fruits of Akal is the metaphysical capacity. The ability, and this is a word we don't even use today, do we? This is a precious word, but in the history of the West, metaphysics is almost like talking about sorcery. It's like talking about charlatans. That's not true. Metaphysics is that realm which you cannot see that dominates the realm that so you have physics. Physics is the natural world. Physics is nature in Greeks, Greece, in Greek. And metaphysics is what is around the natural world. I cannot understand the natural world until I can link it to its ultimate cause. And that is the existence of God in a who is the infinite. So Apple has this capacity. And as we said before, one of the great crimes or mistakes, in my belief, of Western civilization in the last 250 years is that it negated the metaphysics. Not interested in that anymore. Akal is the ability to discern the essence of reality. You know, finite being points to infinite being. It must. We can talk about that you know, at length. You know, we have to. We've got to understand how we look at this world and see it as signs of God. And this is not magic. This is not something that, you know, is intangible. It simply requires us to use and to cultivate our intellects and to get the right cognitive frames. Um, the primary fruit of Apple is belief in God. Your soul believes in God. Your intellect believes in God. It is embedded in human nature, the fitrah, and again, it is the first right of God upon us. It is Um al faraid the mother or the foundation of all obligations to know God by your intellect. This is very important because many Muslims today, they don't study this anymore. You know, um, a lot of us are attached to the religion for very good reason. You know, we love the Prophet, the greatest of creation. Okay? And we have to cultivate that love in us. We love this religion. We love our prayer. We love our fasting. We love breaking the fast. But these are emotional things. And this emotion is good for you. But what about your children? What about your grandchildren? We have got to be able to open the mind so that we train people to look at creation and to read the book that is there. And to see that what we believe about God is absolutely true and demonstrable. But you can only do that with intellect. Um, for all the jurists, the first obligation after taklid is to have rational knowledge of God. It is Umm al farabi Imam Abu Hanifa believed that every rational human being must come to terms with Tawheed during their lifetime, whether they receive the prophetic message or not. Uh, and Abu Hanifa has Quranic proofs for that, he has rational proofs for that. The only thing that I would say is that when we look at our brothers and sisters in the modern age, 
Um, maybe this is a little bit different with them because of the fact that the modern human being is a person whose cognitive frames have been tempered, have been fundamentally changed. Traditional people and traditional societies often were people who could just look at reality and glorify God. You know, this is something what is, which is there. But modern human beings, we, we don't understand the most fundamental concept. And we don't know how to reflect. We don't know how to think. So when we teach Aida, which is, this is our first obligation. We have to give people the cognitive frames that enable them to look at the finite and to understand how it points to the infinite. And to see that change and the potential of change does necessarily indicate temporality, that things have a beginning in time and place. <clears throat> these are powerful concepts. And you know, it's, we've got to understand these, and we've got to give other people this understanding. And when you do that, that will be a revolution. That will be a revolution. American people need to learn how to think. European people need to learn how to think. They don't know. They know how to do all sorts of computations. You know, they are very intelligent human beings. They are builders. They are amazing. But they do not know how to reflect. They do not know how to read the book of creation. Abu Hanifa might not have excused them. He certainly, that's his basic position. In the Quran, Allah says that the disbelievers say, if only we had listened which means listen respectfully, not mocking. If only we had listened and used our reason, we would not be among the companions of the fire. Ibn Ashur says they did not listen to the call of the messengers with respect, and they did not use their intellects to reflect on God's signs or on the message that the messengers gave them. For this, we under, from this we understand that the roots of guidance are in good reception of the message, honest reception of the message, with Adam, with Husn Talaqi, receiving it in a good way, and careful consideration, Husn Mabal, no prejudice, no bias, I have to know the truth. You know, so if you claim you have the truth, I have to listen to you on it. Uh, Al-Bursawi says this verse indicates that Aql, is a hujja of tawheed. That aql is a manifest proof of tawheed, just as hearing the message is. They did not listen with their hearts or use the intellect of their souls. They listened with ears that were blocked by prejudice, by uh, passion, you know, by self-interest, many other things, and with <clears throat> intellects that were locked shut and defective for that reason. Uh, God makes the apple a proof against the disbeliever. So this is very important. You have to have apple to be morally responsible. Because that means you, you're not insane. It means that you're not below average, drastically below, right? But you can still have apple and lose it. But you do not lose the moral responsibility to have used it. This is when aql becomes a proof against us. And uh, Allah says, when you call to prayer, they take it from mockery and play. In other words, they don't have the intellect that says, take religion seriously. What are they doing? They're praying to God. How can you mock this? How can you take this as, as a light thing? That is because they are people who have no intellect. They are people who have intellect, but they don't use it. And because they don't use it, God has made it impossible to access, and he will use it to destroy them. Allah says, as for those who disbelieve, or those who willfully disbelieve, it is the same to them, whether you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. Why? God has put a seal on their heart. He has put a seal on their intellects. They have it. They have hearts. But they are sealed and on their hearing, so they're not able to listen. Over their eyes, there is a veil. This is because of what they have earned. For them, there is a great torment. Um, 
bottom. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip this. Uh, we must be worthy of our intellects. Let, let's, uh, let me see. Um, Allah says also in the Quran, "Kalla bal rana ala kulihi ma kani yasibun." No, this is not true. No, rather their hearts have rusted over by the evil they have earned. So this is the curse of not using it. And again, all the good that you have, you have to use it. When you use the good that you have, God will reward you in the next life. Right? You believe you do good, God will reward you. But he rewards you right now because he's kareem. And his reward to you right now is to keep. You did good. You had good thoughts. You had good ideas. You did good things, so he makes it easier for you to do good. He opens the door of good. He opens the doors of salvation. And if we don't do that, we have evil thoughts. You know, if we are not honest with ourselves, if we do not understand the seriousness of life, and we make a mockery of all things and play, then Allah punishes us. Part of that punishment is that he makes it more difficult to do what is wrong. And that can go on and on until he seals it. Like you have passed the point of no return. And therefore, your intellect will be there. I will seal it all. And it will be a proof against you. And in fact, you will not be comfortable with what you're doing because you know it's not right. You know, we knew a woman in Michigan years ago who was a she didn't believe. She was a feminist at the time when there were few feminists. She was an atheist. She had a little boy. She, uh, her marriage was broken, unfortunately. And one time she was at a group of our brothers and sisters, and she was talking about, she was an atheist. She was saying, speaking in the strongest terms, and her son got far away from her into the street. And then she noticed that a car was coming really fast and that that child was going to be killed. She saw it. He was between the cars. He came out in the street. And what did she do? She said, oh my God. She wasn't being fun. She said, oh my God. Like that. And that's what? That's istirahat. That's what we call calling upon God for help. She said, oh my God. So what is this? What were you just saying a second ago? And this is because in her heart she knows that's the truth. The aqla is there, but it's sealed over. Yet, in instances of extreme fear or joy, it can come out. And then the next day, and, then, and the child is saved. Because when you call upon Allah in iltirah, in extreme necessity, he will answer your prayer. And so the car slammed on its brake. There was dust and noise and screeching, and the child came out just by a hair. And he wasn't touched. And then he ran to her, she ran to him, she was crying, she embraced him, and so she has intellect. And may God guide her. And may God enable her to access her intellect. But you have to do good. Okay? And uh, we're out of time, aren't we? Okay, so um, truly we have created for Jahannam many spirits and human beings. They have hearts. They have intellects. Which they do not, with which they do not understand. They don't use them. They have eyes with which they do not see. They can see, but they choose not to. They have ears with which they do not hear. Such as these are like cattle. Rather, they are more strange than that. It is these who are the heedless. They don't take life seriously. So we'll end right here. We have to guard and defend our intellects. And we have to guard and defend the faith. This means in a nice way, in a merciful way, in a loving way. We have got to be able to take this message to ourselves, to our communities, to our families, to our homes, and to the society at large. And it's, we have got to teach many things. Really, you know, the task we have before us is a beautiful task. It is enlightening. Look at people like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Look at the brilliance with which he speaks. Look at the depth that he has. That's not fascinating? Yes, it is fascinating. And this is what we ask of you. Learn this deed. Imbibe this deed. Learn how to defend it in your own life because you've got to do that. 
Doubts come to you. Doubts are not a sin. Doubts are a test. How do you answer those doubts? You have a right to ask questions about doubts. And you have a right to be answered. A lot of scholars who can't do that, so they say, you shouldn't have doubts. You shouldn't ask about these things. Okay, but, um, you know, we, you've got to be able to defend this belief in your heart. And you've got to be able to defend it for your children and for your family. And then what about our neighbors in this society? We have to be good neighbors, right? This is our deen. You know, none of you, he among you believes in Allah in the last day, let him honor his neighbor. Sahih hadith. Okay, so what do we do? It's like, no, you know, I've got my religion, don't ask me about it. Um, you know, I just go to the mosque and I'll go back home. Um, you know, uh, we have to really have confidence. But we've got to understand. Look at Malcolm X. He was killed, you know, um, 48 years ago yesterday, February the 21st. No, it's two days ago, right? February the 21st, 1965. I remember that day. You know, that, that was a dreadful day, you know? And, um, you know, this is a person, you know, who wanted to take this message to everyone. And this is a person who read books. Why? Because he wanted knowledge. Because he wanted to understand. He wanted to be able to speak. He's one of the greatest speakers in American history. One of the greatest human beings. You know, the man who stands for nothing will fall for anything. He's, they say that Malcolm is the master of the soundbite. You know, the man who stands for nothing will fall for anything. What? Beautiful statement. And Malcolm's life is like that. It's like he's a man who, like, I want the truth, I want to understand the truth, and then I will speak it. You know, I will say it clearly and plainly so that I can enlighten my brothers and sisters and other people. That's you. You know, we have to do this. We've got to take this message, and, and we can do that. We've got to write, we've got to produce. You know, we have like you know, brothers who are doing poetry and sisters. You know, we've got to take this message. Um, so uh, this is a constant obligation, and one of the things that you know we need to remember also, and I'll end with this, you know, is that um, you know Islam is a religion of da'wah. We're going to talk about that a little bit in the next class. Uh, but remember this: it is a greater obligation on you, according to Islamic law, to bring your fellow Muslim back into the deen. And to give your fellow Muslim a sound understanding of the faith than it is to bring new people into the fold. It's very important for us to bring new blood into this religion. When I met Sheikh Abdul Amin 13 years ago, the first words he said to me was, he said, Islam needs new blood. You know, I'm new blood. I was born a Christian. You know, this is new blood. Sidi Ahmed, James, Baraka, Blue. You know, we have a lot of new blood right here. You know, it's, it's, Islam grows by new blood because it is a prophetic fact. Where does Islam do the wonders in history that enable this religion to live and to reform and to continue? Usually on the periphery. And what is the periphery? The periphery is any place where traditional Muslims come into contact with non-Muslims and have got now to make sense of this religion to people who it makes no sense to at all. And when you have those places, which is where conversion takes place, then a special chemistry happens there. You know, one of the miracles of Islam is the fact that Allah, he knew where to put this message. He put it among the Arabs. I love the Arabs. The Arabian Peninsula is incredible. Okay, he knew where to put them. It's incredible language that they have. We could talk about that for hours. You know, but these are people, you know, and Ja'adullah Ka'bad al Bayt al Haram al Qiyam and Din Nas, you know, Allah made the Ka'bah, you know, um, you know, a, a, a like a king for the people, a qiyam, hayyam. Because the Arabs had no king, they had no state. They had the Kaaba, they had the sacred month. That verse is a huge verse. These are people that had no civilization. Of cities. 
You know, they didn't have governments, they didn't have kings, they had the power, they had the sacred funds. They had the Arabic language, this beautiful, pristine, ancient, ancient tongue. And then when they come out of Arabia, having accepted the life of the chosen one, they mix with Persian, Greeks, Latins, Berbers, Visigoths, Indians, Afghans, different people. And they inherit overnight all the civilizations of the known world going even to the walls of China. And the Chinese come to them. And then in the process of about a hundred years, you have the production of one of the most amazing civilizations in history that is unique and new. How did that happen? It's a Quran. It's a miracle of the Prophet. But one of the secrets of that miracle, sallallahu alayhi wa is the fact that you have converts coming into the faith who know the civilizations of the past, who now are taking the hand of Arab converts, companions of them, and successors of the Prophet, who have got the light. And then out of this chemistry, there comes something new. The first original book written in Islam. It is not a compilation. We have the Muatta of Imam Malik, which is one of the earliest compilations of law. Beautiful book. Elegant, superb, and subtle. It's the first original work that is not like the Muatta or like the compilation of the Quran itself. Is what? We have Sibawi. The book of Sibawi. And this is the book of Arabic grammar and Muatta. And it comes it's of the same time as the Wata of Imam Malik. And see the way he is a Persian who has also Arab blood. Well, we don't know that for sure. But he, in his family, converted to Islam. He was born a Muslim. Uh, he learns Arabic perfectly. He knows Persian. He is an heir of two galaxies, two worlds. And then taking the study of his Sheikh Khalil ibn Ahmed, his sheikh, he is able to compute this in a Persian way. As the Prophet said, وسلم, that if knowledge were hidden in the Pleiades, the stars of the Pleiades in outer space, far, far away, a Persian would be able to get it. And that's Salman and Farisi. And it's also Siba. Little fragrance of apples. That's what his name means. And Siba is the one who says, Amul and Ma'mul. And he says, um, you know, Harf and Ism and Fa'ad. He, he is the one who says, what is it? What is a noun? In the West, they still don't know what a noun is. They say a person, place, or thing. No. See what I said? It is a word that indicates a meaning in itself and is not connected to time. Like, is this a philosophy lesson? It is a word that gives a complete meaning in itself and is not connected to time. What is a verb? It is a word that gives a complete meaning in itself and is connected to time. And what is a harf, a particle? It is a word that has no meaning in itself, but indicates a meaning in a noun, a nominal, or a verb. What is this? Sun letters, moon letters. Why? Why did you make it so beautiful? What are you tempting me with? You know, when I first began, I was like, you got moon letters and sun letters? 14 letters are moon letters, and 14 letters are sun letters? I want to study more. <laughs> you know? and, and this is really the, the greatness of Islam. But this is because of the fact that you have new blood coming in with the people who receive the message. And the history of the madrasa system, that lots of things in Islam are, are, are like that. And this is where we are in the United States today. This is a critical time. This is a critical time. And this is a difficult time. You know that, right? You watch Fox News. Wow. It's like, what happened to white people? I don't know. It's like, what's wrong? There's a book called What's Wrong with White People, written by a white person. It's like, what's going on? Cognitive frames, that's what it is. The debasement of cognitive frames. Don't think of an elephant, George Lakoff. 
Okay, but and we then we are in a jihad. This is a jihad of the tongue and of the pen and of courageous spirit and nobility. We have got to live this religion. We've got to show this religion. And inshallah, we can wake them up. And when they wake up, hmm, these are people that, you know, they have to, Allah in his mercy gives every people on the earth a chance to learn the truth and to follow it. You don't think these people have a chance? I believe they will. And we have to give them that chance. And we have to make it easy for them to understand what a great faith it is that you have, that you inherited. اللهم وفقنا لما تحبه وتعطاه وجعلنا من عليمك السعداء وأمتنا على كلمة الهدى علمنا ما ينفعنا ووفقنا للعمل بما علمتنا به وجعلنا نحن فيه خالصا مخلصا من وجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمع مرحوما وتفرقنا بعد تفرق معصوما لا شفيع منا ولا محروما آمين May Allah give us all beautiful intentions Our intention is everything and uh, you know, may he give us long lives and good health. And may he illuminate your heart with sound knowledge of the greatness of this religion so that you can take that light to others. Uh, so we break now, right? <laughs> of prophecy and human civilization. To begin with, <clears throat> one of the major tasks of the prophets themselves is to awaken the aqal. Human beings are given this great faculty. And this faculty is so profound, so metaphysically powerful, that it can be referred to as the universal messenger of God. <clears throat> but for most human beings, it is difficult to follow the dictates of all. It's very difficult for them to do the things they know they ought to do and to give up the things that they ought to give up, especially when that conflicts with their communal interests or their self-interest and other things like that. So the prophets then, one of their basic roles is to awaken the author and to empower the intellect. Ibn Hayyan says, God sends messengers, peace be upon them, to call people to attention and deed, so that they use their minds and muddle, so that they reflect and awaken from the slumber, the rakhda, of negligence. 
<coughs> this way, it goes on, they cannot say to God on the day of judgment that they were unaware, and that if he had only sent them a messenger who brought them uh, to attention, they would have reflected on the proofs of intellect. Um, the messenger of the prophetic law, um, you know, the, the prophetic law itself is the message, and um, it, it is sent to bring out what was in the human's instinctive nature of the knowledge of good and evil. We're given this incredible nature that knows God, that knows the essence of good and evil. And one of the main purposes of the law, which is the primary thing that all prophets talk, is that it brings out in us this instinctive knowledge that we have, this instinctive capacity to relate to the good, to use our minds, this ability to seek out felicity and to avoid infelicity. The person who has instinctive preparation for this type of perfection is moved through the prophets to what is instinctively good for him. He was moved to receive their call um, and has the desire for the truth. This is aroused in him. And he seeks uh, out those who can teach him and receives with affirmation this message and accepts it because of this, in, this uh, inherent compatibility that we have in us for it. Um, the primary prophetic responsibility is communication of the message. When we study about prophets in Islamic law, um, in Islamic aqidah, we know that we believe that all of God's prophets and all of his messengers, they were truthful. They were people, people who spoke the truth. They uh, were worthy of the trust. They were people who we can emulate. And they completely communicated the message that God sent them with. This is why in the history of prophecy, prophets have to be protected. Uh, otherwise, people will kill them. People will drive them out. Because in teaching the truth, they say things that are not uh, acceptable. But their primary responsibility is to deliver the message. God says in the Quran, never do we punish a people until we send forth to them a messenger with divine guidance. Either that messenger comes to them in person, like Abraham, or Isaac, or Jacob, or Joseph, or Moses, or Jesus, or the Prophet Muhammad, or representatives of that messenger come to them. God says, if you turn away, then know that our messenger is only required to make clear conveyance of the message. You know, he only has to do al This is his responsibility. To, um, the Quran says, whenever a throng of disbelievers is cast into the fire, its keepers say to them, did there not come to you a forewarner from God? They say, yes, there did indeed come to us a forewarner. But we belied faith and said to him, God did not send down anything to us. God also says in the Quran, this is a clear conveyance, this is a balaam, this is a clear message that is being delivered to humankind so that they be forewarned by it. One of the main tasks of the messengers in delivering the message is to establish um, proof of the truth of the message. Uh, here I have Ipamat al and that's just a mistake. It should be Ipamat al So this is one of the main things that the prophets have to do. This is also why the prophets of God, the messengers of God, are chosen among the very best of human beings. They are perfect human beings. They're complete human beings, beautiful human beings, honest, merciful, upright human beings, because this is also part of God's mercy in making the message clear, that the messenger is also part of that message. And the message is a, a person who inspires you to follow them. Allah says in the Quran, they were messengers 
hearers, the bearers of good tidings, of glad tidings and forewarnings, so that after the coming of the messengers, people would have no argument before God to justify their misdeeds. God is truly overpowering and all wise. Um, Allah also says, O messenger, proclaim all that has been sent down to you from your Lord. For if you do not do that, you will not have conveyed his message. And have no fear, for God will preserve you from the people. So it's very clear that in doing this task, which our prophet did, and before him Jesus, and John the Baptist, and Moses, and all the prophets, that necessarily in telling the truth that God wants them to deliver, that they will say things that are displeasing. They will displease the oligarchies, the groups with self-interest, and so forth. And so therefore, people will try to destroy them, as they did with our prophet and all the prophets before. But in this case, God promised our messenger that he would preserve them. God will protect you. Mm -hmm. um, says, God does not destroy the people until after their excuses for disbelief have been removed. And he does that by sending to them messengers who establish the proof of God. This is also our responsibility as heirs of the messengers. That we have to live Islam and we have to teach Islam in a way that makes it clear that this is the truth. That this is the divine message. That's why one of the worst things a Muslim can do is to misrepresent the faith. And especially when misguided Muslims today do things that are absolutely horrendous, that no person with the right mind would ever do. This is an amazing, this is a huge sin because of the fact that this blocks people from the message. And it shows them, and it makes people think that this cannot possibly be true. Who are these people? What is this religion? We have to live this faith and we have to represent it right. Um, also, there are intervals between the messages, and we refer to these in Arabic as fatarat. The word fitrat in Arabic um, is with a pa, which we write in English with, as a T with a dot under it, pa. Here, the letter is tab, so it's fatra. It is a gap, a, a period in between. And so you have then messengers who are sent in history, and then uh, their message is delivered. And always in the history of prophetic messengers, just as the messengers must be protected because of the fact that what they teach will not be popular, so also after the messenger is gone, those people who would have opposed him in life, they will now oppose him by trying to change the message or alter the message or get rid of it altogether. So therefore, throughout the course of human history, you have the appearance of the light of prophecy, and people like Abraham, for example, who illuminates the world with his message, and then you have those who faithfully keep the message. The most faithful of all people in keeping the message of Abraham were the children of Ishmael, of the Arabian desert, who kept the pilgrimage, kept the sacred months for thousands of years. The deviations that came into Abrahamic religion in Arabia, the worshipping of idols and other uh, things like that, this was actually very late historically. It was only generations before the coming of our Prophet The children of Ishmael kept the message very, very pure for a long, long time. So you have people who keep it, people who don't keep it. In the case of the children of Ishmael, one of the reasons why they are able to keep the message is because they have the Arabian Peninsula. And the Arabian Peninsula is simply not accessible to the outside world. It has no rivers, has no natural ports. You know, it's huge. And it has in it places for people to live who belong there, like the tribes. You know, but outsiders cannot come in except with the permission of the people to live there. So the, the peninsula was like a fortress. Protection and then that Allah established the Kaaba, the house of God that Abraham rebuilt in Mecca, and the sacred months, the institution of pilgrimage, 
and you know, one third of the year was forbidden. It was forbidden to fight and to have war. To say, and the pre-Islamic Arabs were very careful about preserving the sanctity of the sacred months. You know, many of our early commentators they say that a man would meet. The, in the sacred months, the person who killed his father or killed his brother, and yet he would not touch him because it was totally taboo. You do not fight during those months. And this enabled the tribes to come together, to make peace, to visit with each other, to intermarry, to preserve the Arabic language, this ancient tongue. Arabic is the most ancient of all known Semitic and Hasidic languages, much more ancient than Hebrew much more ancient than Aramaic. And one of the reasons for that is the Arabian Peninsula that preserved its integrity, and then also the establishment of the pilgrimage. So in history, you have this question of what happens to the message of the messengers after they're gone. And in many cases, the messages are completely lost. They're distorted uh, beyond recognition. And this is why the task of the scholar as an heir of the prophets, is that we preserve this message. That's why it's so important for us to have knowledge. And it's, it is a responsibility of you and me and all of us that when we represent this faith and when we teach it, that we do it authentically. And that means that we have to teach what we know is the truth. We have to show people that it makes sense and that it is the way to live, but we do not move the we don't move the goalposts. Our values remain our values. The truth remains the truth, and this is a, a major responsibility that we have. Whenever that responsibility is not kept and the message is lost, then you have what is called a petrol. You have a gap in which ignorance comes. Uh, the message is lost. God then ends the petrol by sending a new prophet. And then with the prophet Muhammad, who is the last of all the prophets and the messengers, um, you know, he is given success in history like no prophet before him ever had. And then it becomes the responsibility of you and me, of his community, that we live that message and that we carry it on. Um, Abu Hanifa says that the people who are born in the intervals are required to believe in God's oneness by virtue of their intellect. They don't have any excuse for not believing in God's oneness. That's his view. He said, even if God did not send a messenger, it is obligatory for people to have knowledge of God. Um, there are, there's a lot of discussion about these intervals between the prophets and um, the Ashari position basically is that people born in the intervals when the message is lost, uh, they, they are not Mukallam, they don't have technique. But Imam al nawawi who is an Ashari, he said, uh, but there, there is hardly ever a true period of Petra. In other words, like we speak of these intervals between prophets, but in reality, they're never or rarely ever 100% intervals. In other words, usually human beings have an instinctive nature that believes in God, and they have legacies that they receive in the past. So usually enough of the prophetic message comes to them that they know basically what is good, what is evil, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, that God exists, and so forth. And a lot of our scholars have taken that position, that no matter what happened to the message of Jesus, or the message of Moses, or the message of earlier prophets, that there is a basic knowledge of God which is there among almost all people. And that that is enough to show them that they have to seek the truth and they have to try to find it in their lives. If they don't find it and they die as people of the interval, then God judges them according to what they knew. And now he says, whoever dies in the fatwa, in the interval between prophets, in a manner like that of the Arabs in pre-Islamic times, 
and worshipped idols shall be in the fire. This is not a case of their being taken to task before the coming of the da'wah, because the call of Abraham did come to them, and that of, the, and that of other messengers indeed. Um, people are required to think critically. This is very important. So no matter who you are, no matter what society you belong to, no matter what your social class is, um, you have to look for the truth. And the Quran is very clear. It repeatedly states that people who blindly follow leaders into this guidance will not be excused. They had intellect. They made this choice. It was their responsibility to seek out the truth. God says, when those who were followed into disbelief disavow themselves of those who followed them as they witnessed the torment awaiting them, thus all ties between them shall be utterly cut off. And those who followed them shall say, shall say, if only we had a chance to return to the world, we would disavow ourselves of them as they have disavowed themselves of us. Um, and another verse, the Quran says, those leaders of disbelief against whom the word of damnation has come to pass shall say to those who followed them, our Lord, those we deluded, we deluded only because we ourselves were deluded. We disavow before you their claims. It was not us whom they worshipped. Um, in another verse, they will say, Our Lord, indeed, we obeyed our leaders and the great ones among us. So it is they who have made us stray from the path of righteousness. Our Lord, give them double the torment, curse them with the terrible curse. And when they shall dispute with one another in the fire, the weak shall say to those who were arrogant, Indeed, we were your followers. Can you... Um, can you avail us even a little against the portion, any portion of the fire? Those who were arrogant shall say, indeed, we are all of us in this, in it. God has already judged between his servants injustice. So it's not easy to make excuses. Human beings have the obligation to understand the meaning of their life, to search it out, and to look for the truth. And it is our responsibility to make the message clear. Um, usually our scholars say that what is essential to taklif, for the fulfillment of taklif, is reasonable exposure. Being born in a Muslim family, for example, is reasonable exposure. Uh, Non-Muslims living among Muslims are often generally believed to have reasonable exposure. They should check this out. They should find out about it. They should be honest about this. Um, the question usually is about people who live in remote areas where the message does not reach them. So the messengers then have the obligation to receive the message and to deliver it. Um, People, in order to receive that, they have to be of age, they have to have bulub, and then they have to have adequate intellect to be able to understand it, and then they have the imperative to follow it. That this is what life is all about. This is what the test is all about. Um, Quran says, we God said, come down from the garden altogether. Whenever guidance shall come to you from me, then know that as for all those who follow my guidance, there shall be no fear upon them when they are assembled for judgment, nor shall they ever grieve over the life of this world. So this is a basic fundamental of technique, that when the truth comes, you have to follow the truth. Um, some of our great scholars, they say that uh, when the truth comes to you, it comes like a mountain. <laughs> And if you will embrace it at that time, it remains like a mountain in your heart. But if you don't embrace it, you know it's the truth, but you turn your back on it, then it will go away. And if it comes back, it won't come back like a mountain. It will come back as something much less than that. 
And if you take it then, then that's good. If you don't adopt it, then it will go away and it comes back as something weaker and smaller. So we all have this responsibility that when we learn the truth, we have to be serious about it and we have to follow it. We have to adopt it. This is what life is about. So uh, among the natural corollaries of Bulug al Da'wah, this is something that uh, is very important to us, is not just that it validates the faith and that it um, gives us the aptitude you know, to obey. But, um, you know, we must receive the message. We must preserve the message. We must live by the message. And um, having intellect requires that we follow our intellect. Receiving the message requires that we preserve that message and follow it. And this is our responsibility as a community, and this is especially the responsibility of the scholars. Scholars are the heirs of the prophet, as of the prophets, as we said before. God's messenger said, the excellence of the scholar over the ordinary worshiper is like the excellent of excellence of the moon over the other planets. The scholars are the heirs of the prophets. Um, So, um, authentic transmission, then, is one of the corollaries of receiving the message. And this is one of the reasons why, in Islam, uh, we follow imams. This is the way of Sunni Islam, you know, that we have the imams in fiqh. Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. These are imams. Why? Because of the fact that we know historically that these are people who took obedience to God seriously. And they put the bar of ijtihad high, so that whatever they tell you when you go back to your Lord, you can say that this is obedience. This was obedience. It's very important for us to keep that bar high. This is one of the corollaries of receiving the message. Uh, God says in the Quran, we sent down the Torah, in it, there is guidance and light. With it, the prophets who submitted themselves to God gave judgment for the Jews, as did the rabbis, the people of the Lord, and the scribes, because they had been entrusted to preserve God's scripture. So this is what scholars have to do. They are entrusted to receive the scripture and to live by it, to interpret it properly, to represent it in their lives, to stand by it. Um, because they had been entrusted to preserve God's scripture. And to this trust, they were mindful witnesses. They, they were martyrs, in fact. That's what the word implies in Arabic. God said to them, henceforth, you shall not fear people. In other words, you belong to me. You receive this message. You understand the importance of this. You must not fear people. You must not alter this message because of the fact that it's not popular, or because of the fact that some people accept it and others don't. You have to be true to it. Rather, you shall fear me, nor shall you um, sell my revealed signs for a small price. You can't interpret this message in a way that betrays its truth. Whoever does not rule by what God has sent down, then such as these are the disbelievers. So reception of the message requires us to live by it and to do proper ijtihad. This comes as a corollary of receiving the message. We must live by what we have received. We must judge by it. And this is the dynamic aspect of fiqh. Misrepresentation of the message is the greatest scholarly evil. Inauthentic transmission, betraying the message improper ijtihad. God says, so tribulation is for those who write the scriptures with their own hands, who interpolate the scriptures. In other words, they change the message and then say, this is from God. They do so to obtain thereby a small price. So tribulation to them for what their hands have written, and tribulation for them for what they earn from it. Indeed, there is a faction among them 
who distort the scripture with their tongues, so as to make you think it is from the scripture, yet it is not from the scripture. They say, this is from God, yet it is not from God. Thus they speak lies against God, and they do so knowingly. So this is very, very important, that we receive the message, taklif then is fulfilled, and then we have the responsibility to keep that message, to interpret it properly, to live by it, and to give it to others. To betray the message is to uh, break the covenant. Thus, for breaking the covenant, and this is in the context of interpolating the message and changing it, we cursed them, and we made their hearts, their hearts hard, for they altered the words of the scripture, omitting them from their contexts. They forgot a cardinal portion of the Torah out of neglect of the very thing that they had been reminded to uphold. So therefore, um, out as a consequence of receiving the message, then we have the obligation to do ijtihad. And this is to interpret the message in a way that is correct. We want to open the door of ijtihad, we have to open the door of taqlid. We have to follow these imams who were honest and sincere in receiving the message and carry it forth on that basis. The fact that this ummah of Islam is an ummah of ijtihad is one of its highest honors. And it is an indication of the integrity of the companions of the Prophet and the successors of the companion who received this message. When we look at the children of Israel, the children of Israel received more prophets than any people before them or after them. And this is a great blessing from God. By this, God ennobled them over all people. But it's also an indication of the fact that in the history of the children of Israel, uh, there is a legacy of disobedience and of betrayal. This is the way that Moses was received, and this is the way that all of the prophets of the children of Israel were received. The main task of a prophet is to restore the law, to bring back the message. So in order to keep the law alive for generations in the children of Israel, new prophets are sent one after the other. In the case of our Ummah, the Prophet comes, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he delivers the message fully, and then it is received by his companions, and they are entrusted to do ijtihad. They are entrusted to keep that message alive and to take it forward by interpreting it in a way that is authentic and genuine. Okay? And this has been the history of Islam, the history of great mujtahideen in all of the fields of Islam, who receive the message, who honor the message, and then who carry it forward. And this was given to us as a test, but also the fact that this is the nature of our history, it indicates the great integrity that Muslims were known to have and that they have to have with regard to their message. So the finality of prophecy then indicates that. Uh, these are signs of the special merit and integrity of the Islamic community. The children of Israel did not merit this. They had hundreds of prophets in order to ensure that the message would remain unchanged as long as possible. This is what the Quran tells us, but this is also something which is borne out in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered after World War II in Jordan are uh, biblical writings that were kept by a community of Jews in the Dead Sea who had received what they believed to be the authentic message, the message of Moses. One of the things that they write is that they have to have this protected community, this <clears throat> secluded community and secretive community, because if they disclose the message that Moses actually taught, that they will be killed, and the message will be destroyed. One of the primary beliefs of the Dead Sea Scroll community is that they believe 
that the coming of the Messiah was near. In fact, they lived in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Only decades before the coming of Jesus, peace be upon him, and they believed that the Messiah would come and they would receive him. And then after the Messiah would come the great prophet of the end of days, who's called in the Bible the Deuteronomy prophet, the prophet of 1818, the prophet who that Moses said he will be like unto me, and he will be from the midst of your brothers. And whatever he says, you must obey you must follow. And whoever hears that prophet and does not receive him, God will take him to task. So for the Dead Sea Scrolls community, that was the most important belief of all. It was the belief in the prophet of the end of time, which is our prophet, <coughs> and they had to protect that message. If they revealed that message, as they say, that, that would not be acceptable for the children of Israel, and they would be killed. So the, the, the keeping of the message is a great challenge. It is a great responsibility. It is a great difficulty. And uh, you know, this is the foremost responsibility um, of the scholar and of the community. As part of this also, we have the responsibility to deliver the message. And uh, Lucy says, it is clear that our ummah has the obligation to call others to the religion of Islam. Uh, we have general and specific obligations, and uh, you know, this is one of the greatest ones that we have. Al Imam al Ghazali says regarding our Prophet, peace be upon him, that there are different categories of ignorance about him. There are those who do not receive his da'wah and have never heard of him, and he said, that These people shall certainly have the garden. There are those who receive his da'wah and the appearance of miracles at his hand, and knew his high moral character and noble attributes, but did not believe in him. These will surely be people of the fire. There are those who heard false reports of him, as uh, if he were, God forbid, an antichrist, a Dajjal. For those, I hope that they will be uh, people of the garden, because they never heard anything to awaken their desire to believe in him. That's certainly the condition a lot of people today. Uh, let's uh, go on now to the final lecture, and then after that we'll have time for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we want to talk about the meaning of the word teklif, um, which I have called here uh, moral and legal after. Um, just as the intellect has different degrees, so also teklif has different degrees. There is a type of teklif which is a burden, which is a, the answerability that comes for people who don't respond to the truth, who don't care about the truth. Okay, uh, so all human beings that are of sound mind and who uh, are, have majority, they have this ethical, moral imperative to seek what is right and to do what is right. And in that sense, a technique is a burden. It is answerability. It is responsibility. It is a duty. The other aspect of technique is that technique, once it is embraced, and once it is accepted, it empowers. You know, it becomes an aptitude to do good and to approach God and to be accepted by God. Uh, it enables us to approach Him, to approach Him through fulfilling our responsibility. Uh, let's begin by looking at the Arabic word. The word teklif comes from the root kath lam tha, and uh, Again, Ibn Faris, this, when he studies the root meanings of Arabic words, um, he tries to take them back to one or two root meanings. And he says that this root has only one basic meaning. And it is the one expressed in the Arabic statement, Kelly the shape, 
which means that uh, he loved a thing passionately. Kelly Fishay is to love a thing and to be passionately attached to it. So this is the, the meaning that's at the root of the word. Out of this root, uh, there, de there develop other words that indicate undertaking something that involves hardship, mashakka, or difficulty, mashakka, or hardship, also. The word kulfa in Arabic uh, means difficulty. It implies mashakka. And literally, the word taklid means the imposition of difficulty. It is when a kulfa is imposed on you. Okay, but it's very important for us to understand that the kind of burden that is imposed upon us is for us a burden of love. In other words, you know, we have to receive the prophetic message. That's not easy to do. We have to believe in the prophetic message. We have to live by it authentically and genuinely. That is the imposition of difficulty. Yet at the root of this is the love that we have for God and his messenger and the love we have for the truth. So teklif then, in terms of its root meaning, implies a type of difficulty that is rooted in love and passionate attachment. We could uh, illustrate that, for example, by the difficulty a mother has in bearing and caring for a child. That is one of the greatest difficulties of all. And yet, the woman is miraculously able to do that because of the love and the passionate attachment that she has to that baby. It is like the difficulty a good person endures to care for the family, the sick, the elderly, and others that we love. It is like the difficulty of a physician who loves and honors his profession or her profession and therefore takes care of the patients and bends over backwards to do uh, you know, the best that they can. It is like the difficulty of a lover of knowledge which he or she endures to master that knowledge and to spread that knowledge, to become worthy of it, to be a scholar, a teacher. Most profoundly, it is like the knowledge of the man or woman who knows and loves God and seeks to fulfill the rights of God's lordship over us and to, be, and to be true servants. This also implies that it is a difficulty assumed by choice. It is not a moral burden that we bear whether we like it or not. We gladly accept the technique you know, that God calls us to. Teklif establishes the right of God's lordship and the duty upon us of servanthood. This is the most fundamental of all obligations. God is the creator, God is the Lord. So we, is, we accept that right that he has over us. And we affirm the obligation that we have to be God's servants and uh, you know, to devote ourselves to him, ourselves to him. Teklif, then, is more than mere moral and legal responsibility. It is more than just accountability. But for those who have intellect and who turn their backs on it, for those who receive the message and turn away from it, the only aspect of technique that they have is that they will be judged and that they will be held accountable. Technique, though, for the believer who accepts it and embraces it with love, it, is, it has an aspect of moral and legal eligibility. It is a type of qualification. It is an adequacy that we have, a capacity, a competence. So therefore, full teklif is much more than just, uh, it, it, it is, the full teklif is full moral and legal competence. It is ahliya, as some of our scholars say. Uh, 
Uh, Taklif is God's exclusive prerogative. God has the exclusive prerogative to make obligatory what is obligatory, to prohibit what he prohibits. Um, it is his prerogative to make obligatory upon us what is difficult for us to do. And if he doesn't do that, and he gives us a way of life that is easy, that is a mercy from him. Taklid is the obligation God imposes upon us to hear and to obey. Qualification for taklid makes us fully human. Taklid is the hallmark of the divine trust, the amana, that each human soul carries. God says in the Quran, we offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they refused to bear it and were fearful of it, yet the human being bore it. Uh, Taklid embodies suitability for the trust. Uh, at Debussy says, the competence of the human being to carry out the binding obligations of the prophetic law is the trust that human beings have taken upon themselves. The human being is created as fully suitable to carry out the obligations of the prophetic law and to fulfill the rights of God upon us. Uh, but fulfillment of this trust requires authorization and particular modes and preconditions. It is not natural law. It comes from the prophets and goes back to the prophets. It has continuity and it has community. Taklif embodies the wilaya of God and the messenger. Uh, to have wilaya over a thing um, means to have complete control over it and to take care of it. And this is a fundamental characteristic of the lordship of God. And in it, uh, from it comes our obligation uh, you know, to obey the command and to obey, avoid the prohibition. Uh, the bottom line of divine wilaya then is to be. God says in the Quran, to God alone belongs the command before and afterwards. You who believe, do not place yourselves before God and his messengers. God is the patron, the wali of those who believe. One of the things that I had in here before, but you know, when I redid this, I took it out. You know, is to look at, at the word weli or welia, which is the word that we're talking about here. Uh, like a lot of Arabic words, you know, it has uh, it has different meanings. It like projects into other meanings. So the basic meaning of weli is uh, the one that uh, we just talked about. The, the weli is the one who owns something. And the wali is the one who takes care of that thing. From this we get guardianship, for example. And then, out of this, you also get the idea of nusra, of coming to the aid of others. So we, in accepting the wilaya of God, we uh, rally to his call. And then God also protects us. And then out of this also you get the uh, notion of nearness to God which is the wilaya that becomes sainthood. So taklif then is the very, it's the first type of wilaya, that we recognize that God is our Lord. We recognize that he created us. We recognize that he, is, that he owns us, that we belong to him. And therefore, we also recognize that, recognize that he takes care of us and we accept that. So this is the basic line in taklif. Um, Allah says, O you who believe, obey God and obey the messenger and those in authority among you. And if you dispute anything, then refer it to God and the messenger, if you truly believe in God in the last day. That is the best and fairest resolution of your disagreements.
The takrif means to accept the obedience of God and His messengers, even if we do not fully understand the wisdom behind the commands and the prohibitions. We live in the abode of takrif. Takrif pertains only to this world. After this world, we go into uh, the other worlds that are before the judgment, and there there is no takrif. There we only have the consequences of technique in this world, whether we accepted it, whether we rejected it. To some extent, there is universal technique. To some degree, every person has moral capacity and spiritual responsibility. All creation, as the Quran teaches us, uh, beseeches God. Al-Baji says there is no difference among the ummah. Uh, that non-Muslims are called upon to believe. They are mukhatibun. God addresses them and calls them to faith. This universal khitab, this universal address to believe, has the most basic theological and moral components. Uh, Islam, the Prophet said, cuts away yajubu, what came before it. Uh, Al-Qarafi, one of our great scholars, he says this hadith makes it very clear that non-Muslims have a certain theological and moral competence before entering Islam. If they didn't, then there would be no meaning put to Islam's cutting away uh, the wrong that they had done. There is also a specific dimension of taklid, and this is um, the, the privilege of taklid, of, of accepting it and coming into it, and this is why fulfilling the three preconditions is essential. Uh, we must submit to Islam to have the gift of full technique, which is this uh, aptitude to please God and to approach Him. Islam is based on God's prerogatives to impose technique upon us through His prophets and messengers. Islamic technique is theological, moral, legal, and spiritual authorization. Uh, Taklif comes with khitab, with receiving the word. Khitab, the address that God gives to uh, all people in Revelation, is reception of God's command and prohibition through the prophets. It comes with bulug al da'wah, when we are of age and able to understand. It implies immediate obligation to obey. Uh, there is a judgment with khitab. There is no judgment without khitab. We can illustrate that, for example, in uh, the story of the son of Noah and of Ishmael, the son of Abraham. The Quran says, And Noah called out to his son, who was in a place apart, My dear son, embark with us, and do not be among the disbelievers. So when Noah calls, calls upon his son, uh, this is people. This is the address of the prophetic message. And when his son rejects it, then this makes his son a disbeliever, as the Quran says. On the other case, <clears throat> in the case of uh, Ishmael, Abraham said, My dear son, I have seen in a dream that I am to sacrifice you. Consider this and tell me, what do you think? He said, My dear father, do what you are commanded. So Abraham's son hears the people. He, re he receives the uh, address of the prophetic message. And then he accepts it, so then he comes into full taklid, and uh, he is pleasing to God. Taklid is a weighty commitment. It is a dhimma. Uh, we use this word dhimma uh, from a root which is to be uh, unworthy of, of praise, to be worthy of blame. That is because one who does not keep that commitment uh, does not deserve praise, but deserves blame. Uh, Taklif is a principal gift and mercy. Taklif is the key to salvation. Taklif makes us fully eligible for salvation. It links us directly to the living prophetic legacy. It brings even permission and continuity. Taklif also allows us to draw near God and to win his pleasure. Uh, Taklif, therefore, entails potential reward. As God says in the verse that we cited before, Never do we punish a people until we send forth 
revealed to them a messenger with divine guidance. But this also implicitly, implicitly indicates that we do not reward the people also until, or we do not fully reward them until we send a messenger. Ibn Ashur says the verse only mentions punishment because its context is one of justifying God and establishing his proof against those who disbelieve. Its context is not indication of divine blessing, um, you know, but of the opposite of that. Yet it implies that, that um, when we re if we receive the message and we follow it, then we deserve the greatest reward. And if we turn away from it, we deserve the greatest blame. I think I'm going to stop here, and uh, we'll take.